So the next panel is uh, going to be pretty interesting. I think the title is Metaverse, is it real? Is it? I don't know, is it? But we have two outstanding speakers um, who are going to walk us through what perhaps the Metaverse means, what perhaps it does, what it doesn't do, um, what, it, well, what it's likely to look like, perhaps, because it all seems to be a perhaps to me. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's a perhaps to me. I'm not sure. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Kerry Miller, uh, founder, partner, and uh, of Overton Ventures, based out of New York and Miami now, correct? Um, and uh, if you read her story, I really like the tagline. It's the elevator connecting people, talent, and funds, and money, basically. So that's what she does. Uh, uh, Kerry, I, we met in, in Miami a little while ago. Uh, wealth of resource, connection, enthusiasm, uh, intelligence, I mean, talking about tokenomics, talking about the future of work, talking about Web 3.0, today about metaverse. Uh, so uh, this is going to be very interesting. Cynthia, um, Cynthia Johnson is a co-founder of Bell & Ivy, a branding company. She's an author, a world-renowned speaker. Um, she does a lot of marketing, personal branding, company branding. She's been involved in the trenches with uh, small, medium, and large companies. Uh, exited a couple of companies already, I believe, uh, one company. Um, and social media followers maybe about 13, 14 million now? No, no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but she'll get there. But I'm going to let you uh, make a further introduction of yourselves individually so that we get a better perspective of what's important to you and who you are. And then take, take us through the metaverse, yeah. literally, perhaps, figuratively, <laughs> or in a dream state, whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. And Cynthia, welcome. Thank Round you. of applause for them both. Thank you. Thank you so much, Link2, for having us here. It's a pleasure and an honor. I will say back to the power of connecting in the network. Lou Kerner brought me to a dinner at Art Basel last year where I did meet the team and have been incredibly impressed and agree with the vision and definitely see the opportunity. Uh, so I kind of will counter it to say, is the metaverse real? Is reality real? You know, my favorite conversation to have, a social conversation is, are we actually currently in the metaverse? Uh, so as we have this discussion, be thinking about that as well. So my background, um, I currently am one of two co-founders of Overton Venture Capital. We are a seed-focused venture capital fund investing in consumer tech, the future of work, and consumer health. Similar to many individuals in the room, we have been leaning in heavily to blockchain technologies and, and Web3 as we see the future through these technology advancements. Uh, my background is actually finance and organizational behavior and design. Um, I spent 10 years at Goldman Sachs working on very various strategy roles that had to do with the intersectionality of data and people and looking at the utilities for success on looking at that data. Um, and then from there, I really early in my career in management consulting, I started my career in 2001, uh, where my first clients were Enron and Tyco and New York Stock Exchange. And it was very clear to me that these clients of mine, there had gaming that was involved in the incentives. Um, and I got fascinated with the organizational psychology of how the incentives might dictate the outcomes of these publicly traded companies. Um, fast forward today, I'm now using that same methodology and thinking through how we invest in early stage companies and then helping those companies as they grow, uh, going from five to 100 employees and making sure some of the conversations that we had about culture, making sure that those leaders understand the impacts of having a really sound culture as companies grow. And then full circle today, as we have many conversations to talk about Web3 and decentralized finance, thinking through tokenomics really, um, is thinking through the networks, the nodes, and how they communicate, how they incentivize 
those in the community, in the organization, and many organizations today are being restructured in a decentralized way. So that's also where I'm spending a lot of my time. So really great to be here. I'll throw it over to Cynthia. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was in, invited to this very early breakfast. It was 7 a.m. on day one, and I, I was lucky to sit right next to Carrie. <laughs> And listening to her speak, I was like, wow, I'm on a, this panel with this guy, Lou. You should definitely be <laughs> on it. Um, and now here we are together. I don't know how that was uh, crafted or how it came to be, but I'm very, very excited. So uh, a phenomenal background. A, a little bit about me. I started my career actually in live streaming uh, before it was cool or accessible. And uh, it was a, a social media live streaming. And got to kind of see what it was like working on the platform side of some of these uh, social channels. And it was a mess. It was such a mess. Uh, from there, I went in, I got into SEO and social media for behavioral health care companies. I uh, learned a lot about Web2, I'll call it out, and digital marketing in general. Uh, and I remember asking myself, Wow, that's weird. These trending topics. Everyone in the world's looking at the same ten things. Isn't that fun? Um, and I, I said, you know, I've got to know more about this. Uh, that agency ended up uh, being acquired by a uh, behavioral healthcare company. Uh, and after, after it was acquired, we went through this major uh, reputation management crisis, we'll call it. <laughs> and. We're like, what are we gonna do? Uh, we had all these websites, the brand was, was tarnished, and you know, we took an equity deal, and we're like, we gotta get this stock back up. Uh, and so what we did is we launched these, we called it employee branding at the time, campaigns. And we just started putting our people everywhere, on TV, on this, and, and started to drive leads in very unique ways. And we never really had them go on and sell anything. We said, all right, hey, go up there, and you know, you just happen to work here. And from there, I was like, wow, that's the future. That's what's that's what's up. People are important, and not just some people, all people, and especially in a group. Because what we found out is we had ex-professional baseball players, and you know, all of these like incredible people with stories that just kept making us more important. Um, so I quit that company and we founded Bell and Ivy and our goal was to do personal and, and at the time we called it employee branding. Um, and we were told we were gonna fail and no company would ever do that. And just to go on and from there, we've, we've run campaigns uh, for you know, small companies in the beginning and startups uh, a lot. We're, and then a couple of years ago, we actually helped uh, Walmart create a employee branding strategy, which was really incredible. So they actually used their, their own people in the stores and let them create the metaverse. Uh, and, and now we consult on lots of projects in behavioral health, uh, work with lots of VCs, investors, private equity firms who are all trying to do the same thing and get into the same field and they want to know more about it. So uh, I've seen the metaverse from many angles as I'm sure many of you have too, if you, if you don't know it. That's, uh, that's my background. Awesome. <laughs> so as we were powwowing on kind of format and structure, we thought it would be fun to start off and also, uh, similar to Matthew, do some exercise. Uh, so how many of you have heard of the metaverse? I'm assuming everyone in the room. Um, I think around 30% um, of the world has not heard of the metaverse. Um, just to kind of put it in perspective, still, still very early stages. Uh, many of us know it because Mark Zuckerberg in October of 2021 changed the name of Facebook to Meta. Uh, the origins of the metaverse actually would say is in, I think, 1992, Neil Stevenson had a book um, that talked about the metaverse. And the metaverse was really a virtual reality experience that was similar to the internet, but it was bringing the internet to virtual reality. And from there, that's where kind of the, the concept of the metaverse has continued to, to, uh, to arise. Um, the next question for everyone, uh, who has a definition of the metaverse? There's many, def there's no right answer or wrong answer, but does anyone wanna share 
what they believe to be a succinct definition of what the metaverse is. And we'll share ours as well. So if you are shy and you don't wanna, that's fine as well. Lou Karner, and we might need a mic, so. Is there, is there a mic? Hey, uh, for me, um, I call this reality. And <laughs> <laughs> I think once like you start doing this, now you're, this is mixed reality and you're in the metaverse. And that goes all the way from here to, you know, on the other extreme is, is with an Oculus. And I'm pretty sure every day for the rest of my life, humanity is gonna be spending more time in the metaverse and it's gonna be more immersive. Anyone else? Since it's, since it's here, I'll chime in. I, I, I mean, I, I agree, I, I, although in, I've actually created a story around this, which you'll hear about later. And in our law, we have terror, which is analog reality. And then we have digital reality, which is volumetric. I think most people, when they think about the metaverse today, think about a volumetric, immersive, three-dimensional internet. Um, which is probably helpful in VR or AR context. But then I think then we have, well, in our law, we have Terra, DigiTerra, then MetaTerra, which is this blended reality. And I find the metaverse actually a little bit of a confusing, misleading term in that sense. And I find it more helpful to actually think about digital reality versus physical reality and blended reality. These are kind of the two, the three poles that I think really make up where we are. Yeah, and that, I mean, look, again, there's no right answer. My simple definition, which is many's, is immersive technology that connects people, places, and things um, at its simplest form. Yes, leveraging VR, AR technologies for those immersive experiences. And I don't know if you have anything else to, to add. No, I actually agree completely. Anytime there's a screen, which is I mean, not aside from your own phone, there's what, how many we're looking at just in this room. Um, so it's, it's everywhere and it's everything because we're always looking at a screen uh, and probably only when you're asleep or, or at a dinner uh, facing someone, you're, you're not there, so. And that's kind of exactly the point. And the historical use cases and current use cases have really been in gaming majority of those that have leaned into the metaverse historically and now are using it for gaming Pokemon Go. I mean, I think 150 million active users on Pokemon Go. Um, um, it was interesting as we were kind of preparing for this, looked at some stats to say, why did people join the metaverse recently? 50% of individuals who have joined the metaverse community recently, it was for work purposes. They recognize that there is work there and they wanna, wanna be on it for it. 40% uh, for education, 20% um, for adult entertainment, not surprisingly. And I actually, I, I did look at an uh, adult metaverse, although I felt like my investors are very uh, conservative and that might not be the most best route. However, I am an investor in a fund that did invest in it. So there are every industry, every application possible, but just to kind of frame, there are many uses of um, the metaverse. Um, and so today we thought that we would spend some time talking about specific examples of projects that we're actually working on right now. We're both looking at these, these technologies. We're at both advising companies as they're thinking through, how do I insert myself as a brand, as a company, uh, my brand or service into a virtual store. JP Morgan has a branch, Gucci has a store. So every store is thinking through, how do I insert myself into the metaverse for my customers. However, they're also thinking about it. Hey, my distributed team, 50% of my workplace or 100% is distributed. And so I need a virtual headquarters. Think about how do you get that water cooler chatter virtually. And so companies are also thinking about that as they enter the space. And so with that, we thought it would be helpful to walk through some of the, the examples that we're working on today. Yeah, and, and even more specifically, I think a lot of the projects that I'm working on are for, for people who are either trying to create community or tap community. And uh, 
the truth is we all say community over and over and over again, but our traditional definition of what community is and what it's becoming and how it's defined online and how many you can belong to is very, uh, it, it's evolving rapidly. And the, the uh, interesting piece is that there's a lot of nuance, right, in metaverse that allow for people to join community without, if you're, if you're, not, if you're unaware, you don't even realize that they're in it. Um, and something we, we were talking about earlier was uh, we helped a client uh, with, an, with an ape. We helped them launch their ape and they did this, this whole announcement. It was really uh, fantastic. But the more interesting piece was that they wanted this, their ape decked out in Gucci products, really tiny ones that you couldn't even know they were there and they wanted no mention of it. Do not tell anyone that I spent all this money on a Gucci pen. And I thought, okay, so there's a here's the sub community in the community, and then there's sub communities within those communities, and they and you have to really dive in and explore to understand the importance of each individual piece, which we don't really have the time to do. So you need to first and foremost just decide where do I want to belong and who do I want to attract. And I think what that means is becoming. Uh, goal focused in metaverse is just the same in the real world, but it really in metaverse is huge because if you don't know what you're looking for, you're just going to be lost. Just going to be out there like everybody else on their phone on Instagram all day. I'm on a metaverse. Um, and so that that's something that I think stands out to me a lot. Yeah. Um, and the power of community back to look at any decentralized yeah. project, the utility of community. So many of these. And, I realized maybe to take a step back, there's many platforms now for metaverses. There's, you know, Facebook is tackling it. They, their budget last year was $10 billion. You know, I think of losses that they took, 10,000 roles they're looking for, you know, the mammoth or the whales of the metaverse, where I think it's projected that you're not even gonna see anything from their metaverse to 2025 or years away. Um, and then there's ones that are already in existence. I give virtual tours on mm -hmm. Decentraland. You can go on Decentraland to Decentraland right now, they have the equivalent of Fifth Avenue on Decentraland where millions of dollars have been spent on property for Gucci and others who have stores on the Fifth Avenue equivalent in Decentraland. Sandbox, on the other hand, another metaverse, and by the way, they all have public tokens. So if you don't wanna buy one of the pieces of land there, you could buy into their tokens. Sandbox, talk about the community and the utilities, they have Dead Mouse and Snoop Dogg and Atari um, and Bored Apes. Uh, there's a project that Lou and I are, are working on and I'll talk about it later. We're building a campus on the sandbox because we want to educate and build a community on education around Web3 and DeFi. And so the utilities and the pricing of these different platforms is very much dictated by the future vision of who's there because these spaces right now, we're both consulting to projects that own the land, but they're not developed yet. It's for that future, what they're building. And the great analogy is the URL during the dot-com boom of everyone buying up shirt.com, you know, pet.com. They were buying the URL for the, the future vision of what that URL is. It's very similar right now in the metaverse land for that idea of what you can build in those spaces and the community that's already part of it that's creating some of the value. Yeah, I wish I had bought pet.com, but that <laughs> other for another day. Uh, and the other piece to your point is uh, when you're looking at oh, like ownership of things and what does that mean and what does that look like and why it's important. Um, does that does any people here own? Do you own in the metaverse or do you right? Okay. Uh, so similar, I think actually Matthew Lemurl is a perfect example of when you invest in something and you show up and you want to make sure that that thing does well because you are invested in it and all of you are invested in it. So we're all here showing up for Link2 because we want Link2 to do we want Link2 to do well. And that was something that was really understood just by people who were investing in small things, right? Or the exclusivity that was discussed earlier. But now we have an opportunity where brands are saying, okay, my consumer can invest. 
and they, they want my product to be the best because they're invested in it. So you have things like group shopping carts. You have things like uh, if I go in with someone and I buy a, let's say, a, I don't know, a $10,000 virtual Gucci bag, I want Gucci to do well because I want to resell that bag with my, with my group. I can't use it any other way except when it's my turn to use it and I get to show everyone I bought a $10,000 Gucci bag and, I, and that I've subscribed to this kind of thinking or that I can participate in these types of behaviors, which really is what metaverse is about. As confusing as it is, it's just another way to subscribe and show everyone what you like and what you do, but this time you get to be paid for it. You get to own it. And brands become important because you buy them, not because, you know, that he or brands become important because the community uh, that participates with them instead of the other way around. People used to wear, I mean, we still kind of do like t-shirts with logos on them and say, oh, look how important I am. I, I, or I'm a runner, I wear Nike or I'm this. Well, now Nike's important or, be, or the runner shoe because of the people who are wearing and participating online. Uh, and I think that's the, that's a, that's a the real opportunity. And, and, and something that uh, we're doing, it, we have a client in the mental health space, so let's even get out of e-commerce for a second. Uh, and healthcare is, is tricky. Nobody wants to move in healthcare because it's scary and you could mess up and ruin your business, especially in early stages. And so with marketing, you have to think of creative ways to drive traffic and drive people without doing anything that's illegal. Um, and marketers always want to do the illegal thing first. Um, but uh, so something that we're doing is like, okay, uh, we have this app, mental health, for people who have a certain type of disordered eating. Well, it's a very expensive process to be part of. Not everyone can touch it, but the only way to drive leads is to build community. So we'll do things like create uh, everybody, every size NFTs that you can buy in fashion. And now you've got a community of people who are just showing body positivity and you're tapping into this space and you're learning. And uh, so there's just levels. And I know uh, we spoke a lot about this because we both like that the mental health applications are incredible. Uh, and not only is it an opportunity, but it's also uh, a duty. Like we have to do this because the mental health crisis is happening because uh, our children are hanging out in the metaverse in dirty streets and we're not because cleaning of them web up. Too. By the way, <laughs> yeah. because of web two. Right, you know, <laughs> because of Web too. Yeah, and on that, like, there was a healthcare company. It was a little early for my fun, but it was the idea with group therapy, the anonymity, where if you do have an eating disorder or a mental health, you want to stay anonymous, but you want that community. And so, avatars, where you group therapy with other doctors, where you're in avatars, and so this is a way that they were kind of bringing that into the metaverse. So one of the like really incredible use cases is for healthcare companies. Uh, one of the things that we also talked about is, you know, maybe outside of business, just thinking through like personally, why are we excited about it? Like what use cases do I want to see? Um, and sorry if I'm repeating myself, because many of you who I have connected with have heard my <laughs> verbose excitement about the metaverse. However, one of the use cases is and so the plot, some of the platforms that exist, there's the ones that are made up universes. So you think about like infinite cities and possibilities. I want my metaverse in space. I want my metaverse, you know, to Centerland that doesn't, it's a new form creation. There are several metaverses that actually replicate physical spaces. Upland, I'm an investor in Upland. Upland, they actually, the, one of the founders just wrote a book with one of the top investors in this space, Kathy Hackle, navigating the metaverse. And Upland is actually a replication of the exact up Earth property. So you can buy that replica of the house you grew up in, another building, et cetera, et cetera. It started as a gaming opportunity where Dirk was playing Monopoly with some friends. I think he also was at Stanford playing, you know, gaming with his friends and had, you know, is there, you know, the gaming application, they're so complex. They're so like complicated. Majority of individuals, yes, there's a huge gaming community, but majority of us want simple approaches. I want simple games at this point. I used to like my Mario Brothers, et cetera, growing up, but now, the, you know, keep it simple, stupid. A lot of people are gaming in that way, and so that was the foundation of Upland. Let's buy digital real estate assets, let's trade them like Monopoly cards, 
And now, by the way, they partner with the National Football League um, and they're doing a virtual, like in life events and virtual events. They just launched their cars where they have a former, I think it was a designer, Lim um, Lamborghini, who designed the cars around Upland that you can travel to to get to different locations. That's one example of kind of the real physical metaverse. There's another one, Superworld. Superworld also replicates the US and their applications is they're partnering with hotel companies like Hilton, where Hilton says, look, we have a community. We're a hospitality company. We could track, can you imagine the use case I use? Can you imagine if Link2, if we could come back to this hotel in the metaverse? We all know because the blockchain technology says that we were all here. And so a reunion with us in the next right. month is actually on the metaverse. And it's confirmed that we were all here and we can come back to this hotel. So think about the monetization strategies of reconnecting with your audience uh, that can happen here. Also, if I want to go to the store, I know me when I go to the store, I want to go down the aisles quickly. I know my store. I want to pick my items. Instacart doesn't do that for me today. I have to search for my items. I'm somebody I always want different things. I don't have the same behaviors. I want to actually walk the aisles. What if CVS, you know, had their metaverse that I could go into that's my store and I can walk the aisles and point at those things in my little avatar without leaving my home? And so there's a lot of, even though you're hearing about some of these made up new markets, but there's also a lot of applications on what we're already doing that many companies are looking at. Yeah. Yeah. We have two minutes. So clearly we have a lot to talk about and at any point throughout the next day, definitely find us and we can geek out more. Where's but. that mic? <laughs> For the metaverse, really? Oh my God. And there's other web three I mean, conversations. Okay. There's other <laughs> web three conversations throughout the next two days. So I'm sure, you know, it's similar, you know, construct. So your first question was asking, what is the metaverse? And my reaction would be metaverse is in my mind, reality is in my heart. So when it comes to connecting with people, because you also said connecting and belonging was a big thing as well. And I think we can all agree that the pandemic was a great time to see is the metaverse going to work? Because I think a lot of the stuff that's going on now and the reactions and social justice that we're seeing and all these people reacting certain ways is they wanted that physical connection. So how is that going to be addressed in the metaverse? Because going back to that book from 19 whatever, Wes wanted to find love. I have a story. <laughs> it's quickly. So I had, a, I had a child last year and I had a C-section and there was a sheet in front of my face and I was really, really high. And I didn't feel a thing. And I didn't see a thing, but I knew it was happening and I knew it was real. And I think that uh, 20 years ago, there was a real issue with, with not understanding the difference between one, the, the, the metaverse and reality. And there's many case studies that have proven it, but, but we're all so adjusted at this point. Um, I mean, I would actually ask anybody here who's willing to show us their screen time on their phone, um, you know, to prove otherwise. But yeah, I think to your point, we're going to, we're, we're, people and we're learning to adjust and evolve and uh, i think covid and the the lockdowns have really shown that we're resilient and we're able to do those things uh, with the human connection piece the where i see the only threat is with the under 20s you know i think that we're able to connect a little bit more when our brains are still evolving or 25 maybe uh, where we have to be careful which is all why we all have to be on it because yeah. they are yeah and i'll add just like really quickly yeah. just to piggyback i don't think i don't i don't advocate being in the metaverse 24 hours a day <laughs> i'm advocating for their specific use cases whether True. it's corporate engagement yes we've been zooming but can you imagine having that same sense that we're here with your distributed team for that water cooler chatter or doing that diversity inclusion training together in a way that feels more uniting. So, uh, you know, not to replace the physical, it's to enhance it in some way. And I always kind of respond where I open to say, are we in the metaverse now? Back to your point, our brains, our heart, that AI can never be replicated, right? It's based on our prior experiences, the way that we're wired. And so will that intersectionality ever truly happen? I'm not convinced. So, so I know you're saying it's the under 20, but I'm a college professor 
And yes, I can hold classes remotely all I want, but I desperately miss the connection with my students. Absolutely. And they're over 20s. Yeah. And there has actually, a, I can truly see a difference just in the way they react even now that we're back in class. Yeah. So I just challenge you. I'm not saying it, I'm just saying you got to look for the heart too. Oh, oh we agree. We agree. That's we why, absolutely agree. And I will say that my thinking is that everyone in this room agrees. That's why we all flew to Lisbon. <laughs> we were like desperate to, to sit next to, to a human being. Uh, I think that to, to your point, though, it's when as we're doing it, we're getting better at it. Uh, but there are informative years where we have to be almost extra careful because that generation we don't know what they're going to be like when they're 30 they might not yeah. like to leave the metaverse and by no the way, way. <laughs> look what, what it's doing to open up the global world to be able to connect individuals who couldn't be in your class because of their social economic background etc so on the flip side is yes there's some consequences that can happen but on the flip side it is bringing individuals together that would have never been able to move those kind of conversations forward so do we have time for one more quite different to how they think about it because we know the difference uh, or you that argue we don't understand what an integrated world looks like they have a very different point of view but anyway, just a thought. Matthew. Just something to think about. Um, you know, there's uh, 10 million Portuguese, and my bet is this business school doesn't actually teach more than about 500 per year. And so whilst it's fantastic, the professor wants social engagement with the students, with digital, we can teach 10 million Portuguese the business principles that are only going to 500 people in this room. And all this physical infrastructure doesn't really help the rest of Portugal. Yeah. While well, the mic's going uh, over there, I would just say, but actually your point as a professor though, uh, I would argue that the value of business school isn't entirely the education. It's the community that you build while you're there. So something, there, there is an integrated need, Absolutely. right? We need to figure out how to tap communities or how to teach people to do it. And we, so Lou and I, literally, this is the project mm -hmm. we're working on right now is we realize everyone is coming onto Web3 and DeFi. A lot of bad things are happening. It's a rite of passage to have a wallet stolen, et cetera. However, the world is coming on. And so how do we build communities to educate one another and so we're tackling these conversations as we speak to be able to bring on those that can be the teachers in a way that they're connecting with the students in a way that replicates. It's never going to do the same thing. We know the value of being able to touch and feel. And by the way, there's technologies now that are simulating taste and smell. And so that's why these simulations are going to continue to mimic reality. But. Um, so I think last year the United Nations mentioned that there's still 3.7 billion people who don't have internet access. So do you think that the companies who are rolling out, you know, million and billion dollar budgets to tackle the metaverse should be also spending a lot of money increasing access to the internet or is that something that other people need to worry about? Uh, yeah, actually, so during the pandemic, I, we got together with a group of people and created a nonprofit that specifically provides hardware Wi-Fi to foster youth uh, because foster youth were hit very hard because they could not meet with their families, which meant they were separated longer. They were in potentially dangerous situations and social workers also don't all have hardware. They don't have laptops or phones or things. Uh, and so that became really apparent when we all went into these lockdowns, uh, sort of I hate to use this word, but like fringe issues that were, were coming up, and, and the, that was definitely one of them. I know the U.S. has earmarked some astronomical number in, for uh, improving access because it was so apparent, but uh, the, the dis, I guess the, the disparity is in real life, too, and metaverse 
reflects real life. And so I think the, the same kind of investments that we need to make in the real world, uh, I guess that's what you say, right? Real world, okay. Uh, we should also be considering in metaverse, especially as education and, and opportunity move there. Ditto and look technology, whether it's 5G, et cetera, or getting so much more advanced that hopefully that's also going to close the gap. Yeah, apart from the positive uh, things that the metaverse can bring to humankind or what well, isn't it that now human beings will have to adapt, uh, you know, into binary forms of social real world interaction versus a sort of interacting with a screen. So does it portend some completely different society as we go forward? Absolutely. But back to like the original point is not suggesting that you wipe out real world interactions is to supplement and to enhance. So it's like thinking at it from that perspective. On the contrary, you know, you could argue with any change of any innovation, you know, the banks that now can be in the metaverse, I don't need to go in person. What about the tellers? Any industry is going to reform. So yes, I think there's definitely going to be some industries where reskilling is going to be needed to kind of make sure that there are not those types of like consequences. Yeah, and with good, with, with bad comes good, and, and Matthew Lamar actually hates that the banks knew, well, there's a lot of things that are coming up because we know that one industry I cannot wait to disrupt or for it to be disrupted is pharmaceuticals. Uh, that's another <laughs> space, right? So yeah, it'll change and people get weird, but now we're knowing, oh, I'm not the only person that you know, has type one diabetes, but also can't eat carrots. Maybe we should all look into that and no one's gonna crush those experiments and that research and we can start funding it. And so, yeah, is, is, it will be a new society um, and I don't wanna predict the negative. I'm only looking at the positive right now because yeah. we're not far and, enough along. Yeah. Yeah. But... Oh and there's an, yeah. <laughs> we could go on forever, clearly. Thank but you. the metaverse is infinite. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.